Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the surprising disconnects between corporate recruiting and candidate behaviors webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded Wednesday, August 14, 2013. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Erin Jacobson. Please go ahead. Hello, and thank you all for joining today's webinar, The Surprising Disconnects Between Corporate Recruiting and Candidate Behaviors. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. By the end of the day tomorrow, you will receive an email from us, which will include today's webinar slides, recording, and information containing HRCI credits. This information will also be available at ere.net. We have had an overwhelming response on this topic, but before we get to it, I'd like to say a quick thank you to JobVite for sponsoring today's webinar. I would like to introduce Katie from JobVite, who would like to take a few minutes of your time before we kick off the webinar. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Williams. I'm the Marketing Programs Manager at JobVite, and I just want to give you a quick overview of who JobVite is and what we do. So basically, JobVite is a best-in-breed recruiting automation platform, which means we only focus on recruiting and we provide many different solutions and tools for the recruiting function. And some of the tools that we do offer are social open web sourcing and search. We help you build and manage your talent pool while also making it easy for you to collaborate with teammates and with coworkers. And we have incredible campaign management and job marketing functionality and offer full social referral tracking. So JobVite will basically take you all the way through the hiring process from deep applicant tracking, workflow management, dynamic interview scheduling, and company branding with hosted career sites. And here are some of JobVite's customers. We power many of the who's who in corporate recruiting and talent pool sourcing, and really catered to all industries from high tech to energy all the way to healthcare, and spend a lot of time with our customers like Twitter, Zappos, LinkedIn, and many more to drive our products to be all that they are. So thank you so much for letting JobVite be part of the webinar today, and we hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Katie. We are very lucky to have Cindy Lee speaking today. Cindy is an innovator in her field and thrives on craving out new category, or I'm sorry, carving out new categories in professional services businesses. As president, CEO, and co-founder of the Novo Group, Cindy has been a tireless advocate for a revolutionary approach to recruiting. Welcome, Cindy. I'll go ahead and turn this over to you now. Okay, thanks, Erin. I actually am having a craving because I haven't had lunch yet. But uh, in any case, um, welcome to everyone. And um, it's good to see that there's so many people. It sounds like we've got about 700 people online today who are interested in understanding how to improve their corporate recruiting programs. And, you know, Aaron, we, start, we decided to conduct this recruitment benchmark survey last winter because after talking to hundreds of companies, we observed a really common theme, and that was a struggle to find the right talent for their companies despite the relatively high unemployment rates. We certainly had our theories as to why this was happening, but wanted to survey the market to see what the data said. So um, today, we'll plan on reviewing the findings from our survey, including, as uh, you mentioned in the title, the surprising sort of external factors that are impacting your corporate recruitment, two, um, internal dynamics that create a vicious cycle of inefficient uh, spend within talent acquisition, and finally, we'll share some of our proven principles of good talent acquisition practices and what companies should be doing to build a business case for an integrated and strategic corporate recruitment, recruitment function. All right, so before we get started, let's, take, take, let's just do a quick poll. This should be an easy one for you um, to better understand the makeup of our group. Um, if you are solely in talent acquisition, um, whether you're at, at individual contributor level or uh, a director, um, please click on the first button, and then I think the rest are fairly self-explanatory. We'll just give everybody a few seconds here. All 
All right, looks like things are slowing down here. And uh, no surprise, we have a vast majority of the um, group that uh, is um, in corporate talent acquisition or um, in human resources with um, just a very few in the uh, corporate executive ranks. And so within these functions, we've really seen you know, fairly consistent challenges, um, especially with tra attracting knowledge workers and executives. But regardless of the role, um, and each one of these roles has sort of a unique challenge, um, you know, we'll find that some of, some of the challenges are fairly common. And of course, when I talk about these challenges for each one of these functions, I'm speaking in generalities. So in the um, HR generalist function, um, these folks tend to have wear too many hats, so they have employee relations to benefits to, um, you know, corporate events sometimes, and um, the recruiting demand obviously is fairly cyclical for most companies these days, so it's hard to manage that process. If you're in talent acquisition, and whether you're leading a group or you have um, specific responsibilities just for recruiting, the, um, the common theme that we've seen throughout corporate America is that most of the talent acquisition folks have way too many requisitions um, for today's uh, environment. And we'll get into some of the passive candidate behaviors in a little bit. Um, the hiring managers, uh, and, and there are only a few on the line, probably a, a handful. Um, for these hiring managers, I think many of you have probably said, you know, what, what seems to be the problem, right? It's uh, the, the economy um, is not so good. The unemployment rates are um, high. Why can't we find um, that perfect candidate? And on top of that, you probably only have headcount for um, one person, but yet need that one person to do two different jobs. If you're an HR executive, CHRO, or vice president of HR, we've seen a, a big challenge with invisible spend or sort of shadow spend um, with highly decentralized companies. And this really creates a very challenging environment to try to build a business case in order to um, provide a very strategic and centralized and integrated corporate recruiting function. So regardless of the challenge, they, um, everybody wants the same thing, right? Everybody wants high quality candidates. Yet the corporate recruiting world is um, probably where supply chain was 40 or 50 years ago with fairly highly fragmented costs throughout the organization, um, lack of risk management. Um, you know, think about 50 years ago, a lot of uh, organizations had many different buyers um, throughout the organization, each business unit was uh, spending, you know, their own budget dollars. There was not a lot of economies to scale, and that's what we still see in many corporate recruiting departments today. Now, let's um, let's take a look at the ex external factors that could be impacting your recruiting function. Um, let's start with candidate behaviors. So, the corporate executive board, um, I think they've just recently done a rebranding under CEB has a, what, what they call a candidate, uh, active candidate, active passive candidate index. And in this index, in 2006, there was about 22% of the candidate population that was considered passive, meaning they weren't proactively out there looking for jobs. With um, that number climbing to just under 50% today. So how do we get here? Let's think about this. In 2009, we had an absolutely horrible you know, economy, uh, we were heading into this great recession. Uh, by 2010, when we were all doing our budgets, we thought that things should be getting better, but it was a fairly flat year in 2011. Um, there was just a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, tunnel for just a short time. And by 2012, you know, with all the political and economic uncertainties, I think for most candidates um, that were working, they felt like, Things were so uncertain that if they made a move to a, a different job, it could be a very risky move. Today, even though the stock market is at a high of 15,000, according to the research by University of Colorado Boulder, Lead School of Business, the biggest speed bump slowing down corporate hiring is uncertainty over government policy rather than a lack of access to capital or other factors. So, I'm sure many of you are, um, still know people who are either underemployed or just working part-time, um, and this certainly doesn't help with consumer confidence. Um, you know, if you are employed, then you're working two or three jobs and extremely busy and probably don't have time to go out there and be proactive. And, and thus, you know, the 50% <clears throat> that the corporate executive board has of passive, in, passive candidates certainly makes sense. 
So let's see how this all lines up with our candidate survey. In our survey um, of uh, national candidates, we um, had about 1,062 candidates respond. And we found that 46% were happy with their jobs. They weren't looking actively, but they would consider a new opportunity if they were approached. 46%. And only 9% of these folks were actually happy in their jobs and not looking at all. These numbers are scary from a retention perspective, but we should also consider these numbers when we're designing our corporate recruiting process. There are a lot more details about the candidates and um, the makeup of the group in our survey, which I'll tweet out later. But um, just to give you a quick overview, there are 15% of the respondents that were not employed, and this falls right in line actually with the U6 unemployment statistics versus the 7.5% the government is reporting. Um, from an industry perspective, we have an even mix of financial services, healthcare, IT, professional services, manufacturing, and um, an all other category, probably with a heavy emphasis in manufacturing and professional services. From a level perspective, we had folks from the C-suite, so the chief executive officer, um, you know, C-suite, vice president, director, and manager, as well as consultants. On the functional side, we really had a fairly even mix of accounting, engineering, HR, IT, marketing, sales, and um, with a heavy, heavy um, respondent rate from the sales group. So what does this mean to you? So the 46% of the folks who are not really looking um, but would listen, and the 9% of the folks who are happy and not listening at all, we consider that 55% um, of the candidates are considered passive candidates, right? So these are folks who are not going to be reaching out to you and your companies when you post a job. You're going to have to reach out with a product like Jobbyte or um, pick up the phone and, and make a phone call. So um, this is pretty consistent really across all industries. Let's examine how passive candidates stay in touch with what's going on with the marketplace now. As you can see, an overwhelming 70% were using social media, and more specifically LinkedIn, to stay in touch uh, with what was going on in the marketplace. So even though they're not out there actively looking, they're keeping their eyes open, right? I mean, who wouldn't with the business uncertainty today? Uh, that was followed by referrals and personal recommendations. However, and we don't have this on the slide, but it's certainly on our survey, on the flip side, 71% of the respondents who are not employed are using the big job boards as their number way, one way to search for a job, while the active candidates, which are people who are unhappy now and looking for a job actively, um, but they're employed, are using LinkedIn as their number one source, however, to a lesser degree, and then the big job boards. So it was very eye-opening to see the variation of behaviors of passive, active, and the unemployed, which really leads me to examine what's going on in corporate recruiting departments. And if the corporate recruiting behaviors have adjusted to the external market factors. All right, so before we take a look at these internal dynamics, let's just um, do a quick review of who we surveyed. Surveyed over 312 corporate executives. Over 60 of these executives were C-suite, uh, vice president, and director level. The revenue of the companies that responded were an even mix of companies um, that we would categorize on the lower middle market up to 100 million in revenue, middle market 100 million to a billion in revenue, and uh, larger companies a billion and over in revenue. And we really had a pretty even mix of industries with the exception of a fairly high response rate in the manufacturing field. So at the time of the survey last winter, about 71% of the companies were hiring and only 7% had plans, had no plans to hire. All right, so let's take a little bit look, a closer look at the details around inefficient spend in corporate recruiting. The circle that you see on the slide now is what we call the vicious cycle of spend or what we call invisible pain. Um, and a lot of companies, we see this, this situation happening. Um, let's take a closer look and I'll give you an example of uh, somebody I've talked to recently who had this issue. So um, think about it. When you have turnover of a critical knowledge worker role, right, and often um, hiring managers are not anticipating turnover. Um, no matter how much succession planning we, we try to do, 
this is always a surprise. And um, then you've got HR or talent acquisition, which is who, who are overwhelmed with too many positions. In fact, our study showed that 65% of the companies had only two recruiters or less, and that only 5% of the companies we surveyed had time to source more than 20 hours a week per position. Now, that's a really tiny number, considering how, what a big number of passive candidates there are in the marketplace. And that just goes to show that um, the recruiters out there who are focused on trying to get talent in the door um, really don't have um, a lot of the, the resources that they need or time. So then what happens? The hiring manager gets a call from a contingent firm dangling a candidate in front of them saying, hey, we saw your ad, you know, we have a perfect candidate, and you know, they get tempted. Um, and then on their own, they may decide to engage with a search firm. And I'm sure if I were to poll right now, we'd get a lot of people saying, yes, that's the case. And so actually on our survey, we found that 80% of the companies still are paying um, external search fees to traditional search firms, 80% to search firms and contingency firms. Now given how tight the budgets are, you know, it's, it's amazing that there's still such a high percentage of companies out there paying these fees. Well, and on top of that, 60% of these fees are being paid by the business units and not by HR. 60%. Well, what, how does that happen if the HR man, or the hiring manager is not expecting to um, have this turnover? Often what we found is that the hiring manager will pull the budget dollars from another line item, or so they'll pull it from um, another category like professional services or consulting or, you know, uh, the, the temporary staffing. And, and then that recruiting fee gets categorized into um, some uh, generic category, and often accounting doesn't have a specific general ledger code for these recruiting fees. And so then the expense becomes hidden and the controller doesn't know that there's the pain of a very large number. And I'll just, um, if you turn to the next slide, I can share with you that, um, you know, the bigger the company we surveyed, the less they actually understood about their spend. So out of the companies who didn't understand their spend, 52% were companies over a billion dollars in revenue. There's um, actually an interesting story that, um, that got me thinking about this whole topic. And we, we know of a, a company that, um, you know, they were about a billion dollars in revenue. They struggled with um, hiring talent, and, and much because they had everything fairly decentralized. And so what ended up happening was we tried to get our arms around what their total spend was. And they didn't know for sure, but they estimated it to be about $800,000 a year in spend. But they weren't even really sure. Yet the poor HR executive had a hard time um, getting approval for an applicant tracking system. Well, you know, this is just one of many stories of companies that didn't have their arms around um, their spend. And this is, you know, this is in the depths of the recession. and um, Every other, you know, expense was being scrutinized carefully by the CFO. So I guess if I'm a shareholder at a large, uh, you know, for a large public company, this would be highly disturbing for me that these large companies do not have a handle on their most critical lever for growth, which is their people. Okay, let's take a closer look at the recruiting metrics that we surveyed. When we asked the group what re metrics they tracked, it's really not surprising that the top two were time to hire at 53%, and cost per hire at 36%. As these are relatively easy metrics to track, right? But I'll ask you, what these metrics really have to do with quality of hire? At the end of the day, the most important thing the hiring manager wants is really the right hire and the best hire for the role. Because we all know the cost of a bad hire exceeds the dollars spent on a search. And a time to hire can really be a counterproductive measure to quality of hire. Right? especially now given the high number of passive candidates in the uncertain marketplace. So without tracking quality of hire, which is the ultimate measure, and from the last slide we saw only 25% of the companies track quality of hire, um, how do you really know if what you're doing works? The other important area to measure is not just the quality of the hire, but the quality of the recruiting process which equates to time savings for hiring managers. And something for you to think about is if you don't track the quality of your process,
then how do you really track the true cost per hire? I'll just let that hang for a minute in the air while I get a drink of water. All right. So now we'll move on to the principles of excellence for corporate talent acquisition. Um, so we, we know there are inefficiencies in corporate recruitment world. If we didn't have these efficiencies, we wouldn't have 700 people on the call today. So, um, you know, the, the, um, the external dyna dynamics in the marketplace certainly don't help. So let's see what we can do about this. So at Novo, we believe in four principles of good corporate talent acquisition that we'll cover today. We'll start with the leadership challenge. And in corporate recruiting today, which we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about, um, because without the leadership and those who are brave enough to lead the charge to build the business case and make change and drive change, none of the rest can really happen well. Then we'll provide a quick review of other, the other three principles around education, and that really focused on hiring managers, architecting an integrated corporate recruiting function, and finally, technology's role in total transparency and accountability for all involved in the process. So let's take a quick look at our first two leadership questions from our survey. I see there's some questions rolling in, and we'll address those um, as we get to some of those slides, as well as um, towards the end. So thanks for um, submitting some of the questions. All right, so principle number one. What we wanted to know is um, what keeps you up at night? So we, the, the executives who responded to this um, said that their top concerns or what keeps them up at night was finding qualified talent. And then we asked what their top priorities were or where are you spending your time? You spend your time where your strategic initiative, your, your strategic goals point you to. And um, recruiting top talent fell to number three as far as top priorities, coming behind succession planning and retention. Why don't the two line up? That just doesn't make sense to me. So if you think about it, um, really, why wouldn't recruiting be the top human capital priority? Because no amount of training, development, succession planning, or retention strategies will resolve not getting the right people in the door first. In fact, um, a BCG or Boston Consulting Group um, conducted a study with the WFPMA of Fortune 500 companies, and they showed that companies that a company's ability to deliver on recruiting was their number one lever for growth. In fact, the companies that delivered on recruiting uh, performed three and a half times better on revenue and two times better on profit margin. I believe that Dr. Sullivan mentioned this in his speech um, in San Diego earlier this uh, spring. Delivering on recruitment was a bigger lever, lever over onboarding or talent management. Uh, however, when they surveyed the HR executives as well as the non-HR executives, the biggest gap in um, the performance was with recruitment, meaning HR felt like they were performing at a certain level but the hiring executives felt like it was at a much lower level. So this is very eye-opening um, to get this kind of 360 feedback. I'll uh, at, at some point tweet out the links to these studies because I think they're a great read and very par powerful external data for you to have. So what do we do about this? Well, unfortunately, there's really not a one-size-fits-all program as it relates to your more critical, high-demand knowledge workers. However, these are some common assumptions there, there are some common assumptions that companies have about their talent challenges that don't get to the root cause of the problem. One, um, and these are just a sampling, but some of the ones I wanted to, to bring up today. There are a lot of companies that say we don't measure quality because it's too hard and we can't control what the hiring managers do after we get them hired. And I see that we have um, quite a few people asking about how do companies measure quality. And, you know, there's a lot of companies that just get into sort of analysis paralysis um, around this. And what we say is that there's no metric more important than quality. If you don't measure quality, you will never be a strategic part of the business and make the business case for more, a more integrated corporate recruiting, recruiting function. And you want a function that can provide the data, be able to provide strategy versus just being a support function. Another area um, 
that we hear a lot about is we have too much turnover, we need better interview tools. So every time we talk to a hire manager and they have turnover, or they're having challenges with hiring, they think it's the interview questions or the testing. And you know, our um, counter to that is that selection tools are great, obviously, and we all want to be better at interviewing. But the interviewing techniques are only as good as the pipeline of the potential talents, uh, potential candidates being sourced. So if you're not out there pulling people in, you're probably missing 50% of the candidate population or more. So no matter how good you are at interviewing, it's not going to matter if you don't have the right talent coming in the pipeline to begin with. Um, the final area that I'll highlight is we need better quality candidates. We, or we need better recruiters or we need more recruiters. And what we say to that is that, you know, even if you have dedicated recruiters, you have to make sure that you architect a, a business process within recruitment that allows for a proactive outreach process. And if you don't um, architect that process, you're not using the right tools and technology, like JobBite, for example, um, you won't be able to successfully um, really allow your recruiters to, to go out there and reach out to that passive candidate population. And um, so it really gets down to creating that right environment. If your talent acquisition folks have 40 plus recs, in fact, I think in, one of, in our study, it showed that the majority of the companies, recruiters had over 20 racks apiece. And if these are tough to find positions, they really don't have time to do much more than post and pray and be reactive, right? All right, so <clears throat> I think there was a question here that said, um, you know, did, uh, so from a quality perspective, um, how do you measure quality? There's a thousand different ways to measure quality, and you can make this extremely complex. Right? So I, know, I know companies that measure this at five years out. And what we've seen is that most companies get really tangled up in how complex this can be. Right? Well, what if the hiring manager is not a great hiring manager? What happens then? And you know, I can't be accountable for that as a recruiter. But we feel like in the first 90 days, there's certainly things that we as the recruiting community can control. And you might even just consider implementing a very simple uh, three-point candidate survey. Right? After 90 days, check in with your hiring manager. You can do this through SurveyMonkey. You can do it through email. You can you know, you know, pick up the phone and make the call. But um, asking them questions like, how would you rate the overall fit between the employee's abilities against the initial job requirements? Secondly, a simple culture fit question. And then finally, a very black and white answer of would you make the same decision to hire this person again. So, you know, implementing something like this will certainly give you a better feel for if all these efforts that you're making to outreach are, are working. And uh, without some kind of quality measure, it certainly, um, you know, there's, there's no other way that you'll know if you're doing a good job. So we'll be posting more on our website for, on different blogs and um, look out for a tweet to the next uh, benchmark survey, survey link that would be solely focused on um, quality. All right, so now we know that the uh, candidate population is um, becoming more and more passive. And, you know, there's so many different reasons for it. But part of our job then is to educate the hiring manager on what it takes to get past candidates. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. We uh, were working with a chief marketing officer who happens to be a good friend of mine. And after the project, I asked her you know, how she think, thought things went. And she said that she had never had an opportunity to interview passive candidates and was shocked at how that changed her role in that process and could have used a little bit more education on basically how to handle and work with passive candidates. Right. So, it might have been helpful for me to show her this chart, which I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but um, this is data over five years that shows, you know, at the end of the day, 50% passive candidates were hired. Um, but how many, you know, candidates had to be sourced, screened um, before 2,000 were hired, right? So it's, um, it shows a very clear picture to the hiring manager that it takes a lot of work to get to some of these folks. And you all have been in the, that this position as well. I'm sure most people on the call have gotten the call from a recruiter saying, hey, would you be interested in talking? And that day you're not, but a week later you might be because somebody just changed your comp plan and you decided maybe I will call that recruiter back. So, um, so it's, um, you know, certainly 
a, a slower process, right? And sometimes hiring managers are anxious and they think with the economy the way it is, you should be able to get, get at pet candidates quickly. Um, so using these kinds of numbers might be helpful, but probably more compelling is using your own dashboard. So on the next slide, you'll see a sample dashboard uh, that is just you know, one, one idea for you that will show really a quick summary of the number of candidates sourced, number contacted, how many phone screens to how many interviews, et cetera. So you get the picture. Um, so the next time you're working on a challenging search, this kind of tool will help you illustrate in the short run how many people it takes and how much outreach it takes to get somebody hired. And in the long run, it will eventually help you build a business case for change and what it means as an organization to go after a larger population of the candidates out there. All right. So Let's, uh, let's move on to principle number three. This is the search process um, that many retained search firms use, and it's designed to really allow this proactive outreach. So there's a lot of emphasis on planning, which is understanding the, um, the business issues, not just what the hiring manager is looking to hire, but understanding the business issues around um, the position. And what does success look like? Who are the competitors? What are the target companies you know, we might consider going after? What kind of keywords should we be using if we're being proactive? Um, it's putting the strategy together to determine if for this particular type of role, whether or not you even post it, are you going to leverage social media? Will you pick up the phone and do more co-calling? So every type of um, search will have a very different um, strategy behind it. And then and we'll talk a little bit about sourcing. For the sourcing slide, or for the sourcing section, that's probably the biggest bottleneck for most organizations. As we had mentioned, um, a lot of the recruiters didn't have more than five hours a week to do proactive sourcing in our survey. So what that means is they're not going to be able to really get m enough critical mass right, to reach out to these candidates. Um, I'll give you a, a quick story. One of our recruiters I was talking to who is, um, is working on consulting positions. And these are traveling consultants. And we found that the ratios were that on average she had to make two phone calls, two emails, and a LinkedIn connection before she was even on the phone having a brief conversation with this consultant on Thursday evening as they were flying home um, you know, at the airport. So, so every search is going to be different, but um, following this type of process will help. Now, the, this process is a whole webinar in itself, so we're not going to go through it step by step, but to also just point out that these days, closing candidates can be um, tough because of the risk involved. So making sure that you're closing all along the way is a, a very critical part of the search process. In any case, um, this is just part of the process, and you have to really look then at the big picture and, and look at mapping out your internal corporate recruiting process with all your constituents. So your hiring managers, your HR partners, um, the ex executive leadership. And this is not an easy thing to do, but we recommend that you start by, number one, studying the amount of time needed to be proactive with your searches, especially your mission critical positions. Not all positions are created equal, right? So. You want to take some time to, to pilot that. Two, rethink workload. So if you're in charge of a recruiting team, generally speaking, we find that for really tough searches, you need about 15 to 25 hours a week in the first four weeks to really get some critical mass and um, be able to, to do that proactive outreach. So arranging so that your, your recruiters have the ability to be successful is a, a critical component of this. So you might be thinking you don't really have the budget dollars to do all this, um, but you can certainly try a small pilot program, right? You probably, every one of you knows a hiring manager that is so frustrated that they're willing to try something different. And it also has to be a hiring manager with, who's, who has some guts, right, to try something different. And so as we shared earlier, 60% of the budget outside spend comes from hiring managers and business units. I think that uh, with your great recruiting and persuasion skills, you can find a you can recruit a um, hire manager to participate in a small pilot and see what it really takes to get to some of these um, candidates. 
it's really important to note that this process that you outline will precede technology. So technology cannot do its job if you don't have a good efficient process outline first. All right, so um, you know, with that, we also found that companies that leverage technology um, and track metrics tend to spend more time sourcing. So it's an interesting correlation. Um, and this, this might have something to do with accountability, but it also, ha also um, might have to do with the fact that companies that track metrics have the data they need in order to show that they need more resources um, in order to do it right. And then more importantly, you know, it's certainly great to track metrics or what we call results metrics. So those are things like your quality of hire, your cost per hire, um, the, um, you know, perhaps an active passive uh, ratio of how many people you hire that are active versus passive candidates. Um, but the KPIs, or what we call key performance indicators, are some of the numbers that you need to track in order to better help, say, coach your team. So if you're in leadership and talent acquisition, trying to track your recruiter's call to response ratio. So your call to response ratio is really about, you know, if your recruiter's out there making cold calls or sending out proactive messages, what kind of response are they getting back? And do you need to help them with perhaps their message? all the way to are we saving our hiring manager's time and um, are we submitting 20 resumes and getting you know, two people that the hiring manager wants to interview versus are we accepting four or sending in four and they're interviewing three. And finally, we talked about closing. And if you're going to go through this process and this, you know, all this effort to go after these candidates, you have to be um, very cognizant of your close ratios and whether or not um, you guys you are doing a good job closing candidates. So really understanding your KPIs and your metrics um, will help design the reports you need uh, from your either applicant tracking system, CRM, your social media system in order to build your case um, for getting the process in place in order to get better access to a better candidate pool. So um, before we go on to questions, I thought we would stop now and just take another poll. I've given you a lot of information, a lot of food for thought and action items. And, and I'd like to um, get your perspective on what's the top thing you're going to go back and focus on. And so we're going to give the group uh, a quick uh, 30 seconds to answer this question. Okay, people are still answering. <clears throat> okay, it looks like um, the vast majority are planning on mapping a proactive recruitment process, followed by implementing a dashboard, and um, Third, there's actually a fairly large population that um, is already doing everything we're recommending. And so if you're doing that, you have to link in with me so that I can study your companies for our next survey. <laughs> All right, so, um, and then lastly followed by ATS, you know, look for an ATS slash CRM, get a GL code for accounting, um, or all of the above, which actually ranks right in the middle. So, so good, I'm glad um, everybody is walking away with hopefully something that they plan on taking action uh, with. <clears throat> All right, so um, let's move into some of the uh, Q&A. First question um, was, did this survey include companies that used RPOs? Um, so we, are, we did not survey companies that used RPOs. This was primarily companies um, that had their own internal recruitment department. And the next question is around quality metrics. And how many companies, um, oh, hold on, <clears throat> how many companies measure actual on-the-job duties post-hire versus job descriptions uh, from the candidate perspective? 
So only 25% of the companies actually measure the quality, um, which is a very low number, considering whenever you talk to hiring managers, that's the number one thing that they are um, interested in. And then finally, um, what, uh, let's see, what role should agency recruiters have and when should they engage? So, you know, it's interesting because the model of the agency recruiter of a percentage of hire um, is, um, is, I think, in, a, in an inflection point, right? So I'll use an example. My, um, I recently just sold a home. And um, I remember years ago when I bought a home, <clears throat> both the listing agent as well as the, um, our agent would have to take us around, right, and take us to all the homes. And, you know, the, the listing agent would be asking questions as well and getting to know you and getting a feel for what you thought of the home. And with this last transaction, I think my listing agent never even walked into our home to show our home. They have a lockbox. Everything's done by email. And so it just made me think, I wonder what's going to happen to commissions in the real estate industry, right? Because if they're not bringing a ton of value, so in my mind, my agent didn't get out there and give me perspective on what the buyers were thinking. Luckily, I had three offers, so it didn't matter. But um, it, it was an interesting uh, phenomenon as a buyer and somebody who paid that commission. So I think, you know, for an agency recruiter, there is room, right? So even if a company completely centralizes or outsources this function to an RPO or a third-party provider, there are, there's still room for an agency uh, recruiter because there's always going to be those really niche, niche, niche positions where there's five of these people in the world and um, you need somebody to really do a d deep, deep dig, right, to find those folks. Um, but often it's a very hard thing to scale because the agency recruiting world is so highly fragmented and it's hard to, um, sometimes it's, it's hard to find that good recruiter or contingent recruiter as it is to, you know, find the candidate. So um, years ago when I was opening an office in Houston, it probably took me just as long to find an agency recruiter, a good one, as it did to just, you know, do the search myself. So, all right, another uh, question that's coming in, best practices for interview training for hiring managers. What are some best practices you recommend for training hiring managers on interviewing? So, you know, certainly there are, an, you know, an abundance of material out there on behavioral-based interviewing and, you know, looking for um, core competencies. Um, I think the hardest one for hiring managers to understand, especially as it relates to the passive candidate, is, um, you know, it's them still thinking that these candidates are applying to the job, right? So, so I can remember years ago when I was asked to go interview somewhere, and I was not interested, but I thought I'd go and just see what it was about. And the hiring manager was saying, so Cindy, why do you want to work here? And I thought, well, I don't know, because you asked me to come here, and I don't know why I want to work here. And so it's teaching and helping the hiring manager understand the perspective of a passive candidate. And sometimes it's helpful to do that if you put it into perspective on their own personal level. So had they ever gotten that call from a recruiter? And if they're not interested in the job, if somebody asked them that question, how would they respond? So I think really providing some of the data behind how hard it is to get to passive candidates and then, you know, how many passive candidates there are, but also thinking about ways to turn it around and make sure that your hiring managers know how to sell first and understand what the candidates' needs and wants are before they start drilling them with their questions. Okay, I hope that helps. So how would you recommend clarifying a requirement when you do not have direct contact with the hiring manager? Um, I probably wouldn't work on the search, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, that's a tough one. Um, you can try, if you're not allowed to talk to the hiring manager, I think that you're kind of being set up for failure, number one. But if you just, there's no other way around it and you still have to do the work, um, you can try putting together some litmus test questions, um, meaning these are the must-have requirements for a role, right? And um, sending those to the hiring manager to sign off on. You know, the must-haves versus the nice-to-haves. So that's what we call litmus test. I think some of these tools are on our website. If they're not, we'll get them out there shortly. But really distinguishing between must-haves versus nice-to-haves 
and then creating a list of questions um, collaboratively with the hiring manager so that they can sign off on these questions to make sure that these are ones that they would want asked. But I'll tell you that if you don't get access to the hiring manager, um, it's really probably um, a, a very tough situation, um, especially if there are technical requirements and you're talking through someone else. You won't sound credible to the candidate, and quite frankly, you might only have 30 seconds to sound credible to somebody who's not looking. Um, so if they don't think you have access to the source, which is the hiring manager, you might not get much save time with the, the candidates either. All right, so what percentage of passive candidates versus active um, candidates are using major job boards, uh, newspapers? You know, we didn't even survey newspapers. I think that fell into other, but um, the um, I want to say the act, you know, the definitely the unemployed 71% 70, were using the job boards, and um, their second one was also LinkedIn. Um, as far as um, you know, these changing behaviors, we, we tried to figure out why that might be, and all we can think of is that if you're not employed, you have a lot more time right, to go into the job boards. If any of you have ever had to respond to a job ad, you know it's sort of a black hole. Unfortunately, we're all sort of responsible for that um, because we're overwhelmed with 600 responses if, if we do a posting. Um, so it's, it's really important, I think, to to make sure that um, if you have friends who are unemployed that they're also taking time to network and make themselves known on LinkedIn. Um, our candidate behavior survey gives some of those tips. Okay, so another question. What, uh, for those companies that track quality, did they also survey companies at 30, 60, 90 days? You know what, we, uh, this is a great question and actually the next survey that we do will um, dive deeper in the, into the quality question. So this time we wanted to get a broad understanding of the corporate recruiting landscape and, um, and you know, really just seeing where the pain points are. On our next survey, we will go much, much deeper into quality. So I encourage all of you to make sure you um, look for my tweet um, with the survey link coming out later this fall so that you can participate. Okay. Let's see, another question. Typically in headhunting at senior levels, one finds passive candidates. How does one handle this uh, because you have a search and you're trying to place and earn fees? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but it sounds like you know, if you're in, in a, a search firm um, and you're trying to earn fees, I, I mean, obviously, the way to build a long-term relationship with your clients is to make sure that you are finding the right candidates. And unfortunately, if you have competing firms, other contingency firms competing for that fee, it's hard to do a quality job, right? Because if you don't have an exclusive, then your reaction is to get the candidate in first versus doing a very thorough selection job. So sometimes the system and the way the pricing structure is set up doesn't always work in the favor of quality when it comes to having to um, be fast. All right, so we have a recruiter in the Bay Area who is recruiting for software developers. Um, and it seems she feels like she's fishing in a big fishing pond. Um, she can find passive candidates, but getting them to engage is a difficult part. Any advice? So, you know, uh, so Bay, Bay Area recruiter, I mean, it's really sort of a, you know, there's not one um, answer to that. I would say there's many different ways from a sourcing perspective. I know some of our technology recruiters will um, focus in on SMEs, so people who are blogging and out there authoring and um, trying to get referrals. But also some of it is just having to make multiple, multiple calls. So <clears throat> I know that um, there are many candidates who are happy one week and then something changes and the very next week they're willing to call you back but you have to be able to put multiple calls out. People don't like to say no. Um, the other thing I think is um, building a relationship and a pipeline. So sometimes when you have super difficult searches, trying to get A players to move on your time is um, not something that you can control, right? So if they're happy and they don't want to make a move, there, there could be nothing you can say that can make them move then. 
But the key is, is to study that and understand um, how to build a pipeline before the need. And if there are um, a number of different um, you know, ways to sort of build these relationships, whether through social, whether through you know, let's grab a cup of coffee and just network, um, building that kind of pipeline is critical. Um, because if you're not building that pipeline in a very hard to find skill set, um, you're going to be really starting you know, behind the eight ball. So. All right, so are you doing any surveys on recruiting um, the more mature worker and how they figure into the marketplace for the next 10 years? You know, we, we don't have that um, in the pipeline as far as surveys. However, I'll say that um, I did a study and a, a speech a few years ago that talked about companies being very concerned about baby boomers um, retiring and how the, um, the companies are trying to find ways to keep them engaged, even if it's on a part-time basis. Um, so, so I think there's, there's plenty of materials out there, um, not just mature workers, but women. So Deloitte does a great job with that. There's several reports out there um, that they have put out. All right, so let me just see if there's any last minute questions here. What is the likelihood of someone returning a call versus an email? Um, you know, that's, that's interesting. Um, we, we have um, definitely seen that you have to ping them multiple times, right? So you have to send them a voicemail perhaps, send them an email. I've even tried sending Outlook invitations for a time to speak for 15 minutes. Sometimes that works because if they're a busy executive, they don't have time to really respond um, to a voicemail. I've also heard that there's a lot of people who don't listen to voicemails. They'll just call the person back, right, instead of listening to the voicemail. Um, so I would say that um, it sort of may depend generationally, but also um, I found that trying to schedule something, leaving a compelling voicemail and then scheduling something typically works pretty well too. Let's see. What approach would you take to integrate sourcing into a culture where recruiters are still needed um, needed to manage active applicants who apply. Well, that goes back to, I think, our slide on um, the search process when we talked about planning. Um, we can go back there real briefly. So when we look at the planning stage and you start to put your strategy together, you may decide that you're not going to post it at all. Or if there's some you know, operate, um, sort of out, it, if your company says you have to post it for X number of days, you may want to do that and pull it right away. So for example, if you're posting a very senior level position, it's not likely that these people are going to respond to this ad. Or if you already know it's a really tough to find role, then you, your strategy may be to completely put 100% of your time into proactive sourcing. So putting a few networking calls out there, um, reaching out to your network, um, you know, getting that out on Facebook to you know, LinkedIn, you might have a better chance of actually reaching that, the targeted candidate base and spend less time sifting through the volumes of resumes. Um, we have a question about the dashboard, and uh, we will make that available on our website, so feel free to go out there and pull that down. Um, it may already be out there under tools, but we'll definitely um, make that dashboard available to you. Um, and for our dashboard, that automatically flows out of Taleo, which is really nice. So when our recruiters are working, they don't have to track this work manually. They um, basically just have um, the information flow out at the end of the week when they um, provide that dashboard to the hiring manager. All right. So looks like the questions have um, really come to an end. Um, with five minutes to spare, you can thank me later for the extra five minutes in your day. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the, uh, the presentation. We really look forward to more data and more results next year on our survey. And uh, we hope that you'll uh, follow me at, uh, at thenovogroup.com. I'll be tweeting out a number of different articles that you can read. And later this fall, we'll be tweeting out the uh, link to the survey. And uh, please feel free to participate. If you have any um, suggestions, questions, topics, um, you know, good or bad, love, love the input, feel free to send me a note at Cindy Liu at thenovogroup.com, C-I-N-D-Y-L-U at thenovogroup.com. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Cindy.
Just a quick reminder that by the end of the day tomorrow, you will receive an email that will include today's slide, recording, and information containing HRCI credits. This information will also be available at ere.net. A big thanks to Cindy for sharing with our audience today, and another huge thank you to JobBite for sponsoring today's webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines.